Hey, welcome to the CMO Whisper Show. I'm your host, Steve Olensky. Part marketing practitioner, part ad agency veteran, part journalist. I was a writer for Forbes for 10 years. I've had so many insightful conversations over the years with business leaders, to athletes, to celebrities, to, of course, CMOs. The only difference now is instead of sharing those insights through written form, I'm doing it this way. My guest this week is Ashley Black, the founder and CEO of Ashley Black, Inc., Fashion Blaster, and Advanced Regenerative Research Technologies and Associates, or ARRTA for short. She's a multiple Stevie Award winner for Woman of the Year, Lifetime Achievement, and Entrepreneur of the Year, two times number one best-selling author, and two times winner of Inc. Fastest Growing Companies. Ashley, you and I don't remember where we met. I know we have some great stories to tell, but welcome, welcome to the show. It's so great to be here. It's like visiting an old friend. It really is. It really is. I don't even remember. I know it was my time at Forbes, which not to get ahead of ourselves because we're going to tell stories about that. But I believe that's when we met when I was at Forbes. And I think I got pitched to interview you. And then, as I said, you know, we'll get into that later. There's a very, <laughs> very sordid tale. That was such a great dicey story. So definitely stick around for that. Discrimination is alive and well. Cyberbullying is alive and well, and and delete culture is real. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So there's a we tease. Experienced so, it together. <laughs> so. There, well, yes, we did. Yes, we did. Okay, I want to jump in with something that that is really near and dear to my heart, and that's authenticity. Right. It's such an overused word: authenticity, transparency, things like that. But you are really living proof of authenticity. You know, when it comes to branding. Talk a little bit about why and how and do people misuse it? Just authenticity in general when it comes to a brand. I mean, I think your brand is everything. So let's just start with the idea of a brand. You know, all the marketing gurus out there, Neil Patel, all the rest of them, you know, they can tell you it's your brand is what makes you sort of recession proof or temperament in the market proof. And you know, I love the way Simon Sinek puts it. He's like, people don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. And, you know, whenever I first started my company, everybody that came in, I made them watch Simon Sinek's TED talk about this because the reality is what I believe and why I do what I do is because I believe we can live longer, better, and more beautifully. It's that simple. And everything that I do, whether that's make a product, do a podcast, you know, the endless videos and things that I make, it's all in line with that belief. And I have that belief because of my personal story. And it's all true. It's genuine. And I never have to prepare or think because I'm just being me. I'm living like the Baba Gagita says in my Dharma. And it's much easier to live in your Dharma than to try to strive to live in someone else's. So for me, authenticity and brand and actually making that a success, they all, they're interwoven. So why is it so hard then for individuals and, and brands to, to be authentic? I mean, I think what happens is, you know, we go to the advertising firm, right? We, we want to launch something. And the first thing we hear is, you know, have you done your market research, right? And who's your avatar is your customer? You know, these are things that are so typically said in marketing. And I'll be honest with you, I don't give a fuck about that. <laughs> you know, I'm like, who am I? What am I trying to say? And I feel like I'll attract that customer. And maybe that is mass market and maybe it's not and that's okay because if you're authentic and genuine then you're going to attract an authentic and genuine customer that resonates with your brand and ultimately your your products so i kind of throw that whole idea out of the window and just be me yeah yeah let, let me play devil's advocate for a second or maybe not maybe that's not the right term so if, if I'm listening to this, listening to you speak, and I'm, this is great, Ashley. It's really great for you, but you're your own brand. I work in a big company. Mm -hmm. Why is it important for me as someone and part of a bigger cog, right, to be authentic? 
I mean, I think at the end of the day, it's as simple as, I mean, Steve, you and I have probably talked about this for 20, 30 years, but now it's becoming a thing, but it's, it's really based on resonance, you know, just like a tuning fork, you know, high vibrational people attract other high vibrational people and low vibrational people or mid vibrate, whatever your actual vibe is, that is what you are going to bring to you. So whether you have your own brand or you're within a brand and you want to draw those people to you, all you have to do to attract that customer, I did little quotations, which I know we won't see in the podcast, but that customer is to just be that yourself. And if you're that, they will come. It, it's it's not to belabor this, but it's such a soapbox issue for me in my whole career, as you know, because mm -hmm. I've only been authentic and it, it's, it just blows my mind why people, I don't know, maybe they overthink it. Oh, I think so. Like, I love this quote. I pulled it out specifically for this podcast. It's Elon Musk says brand is just a perception and perception will match reality over time. And what he's really saying is be your vibration and then your your brand's going to be created around that. I think that people have imposter syndrome. And I know for me, being a woman, we talk about this a lot, which is that whole owning your power and stepping into your power, you know, people have no idea how powerful the human heart is. I think that, you know, society crushes that <laughs> as we, you know, grow up. And then we have to, in later in life, we start to really remember who we are. But when we can lead with that foot forward, we're completely unstoppable. I know for me, and I wrote about this in my book, I had one of my clients was Timbaland, you know, the producer. And I would tell him, oh, I want to do this. And I have this dream and I'm going to blah, blah, blah. And one day I think he was just tired of hearing me. He just stopped me and he said, Ashley, as soon as you realize your place in the universe, you're going to be a lot happier. Meaning like you don't need to go to medical school. You know, you don't need to prove to anybody that you can make them pitch faster. Just do it. And so I think that's what it is. We just have to go deep inside of ourselves and say, yeah, I, I am that, you know, and for me, I'm like, why am I the person to bring fascia, which I know we'll talk about later to the marketplace. And it's because that is my pers purpose. I am that messenger. And as soon as I owned up to that, it was really easy just to start talking about it and start being it. Mm, I love that. That's a that's a really inspiring story. It really is. And speaking of your story, let's get into this, right? I think the first place to start for those uninformed, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but uh, what is fascia? <laughs> you know, it's so crazy. When I did my TED Talk, I should have practiced in front of a live audience because I started off by saying, how many people in this audience have never heard of fascia? It was the whole audience. Mm -hmm. There was maybe five people out of the hundreds that were there. So this is super important to me that people understand what fascia is because, you know, when I brought my product forward and it became successful, a lot of other products and brands started kind of dropping in on what fascia is and what fascia isn't and how do you treat it. So let me clarify. Fascia is literally a head to toe, arm to arm, inside to out, three dimensional matrix that takes on several different forms. It can be almost liquid, it can be kind of jello state, and then it can be very stiff. And it's best known as our connective tissue, meaning like it holds us together, but connective really has a much more powerful meaning because it is the thing that connects us, I believe, to the universe and to the earth. And it is everywhere in our body and it's our energy system. So to put it in kind of a Eastern way, it's our life force. <laughs> hmm. And, you know, I think that people are out there using foam rollers and, you know, these percussion guns and cupping and all of these things and, and lots of therapy, massage, all of that to impact the fascia. But they're looking at it only from an orthopedic standpoint. 
And the way that I explain fascia is that it is the system of body that absolutely determines the quality of everything it surrounds, which is everything. So it's like the soil to plants. So I, I know the backstory of what I'm about to ask, but obviously, you know, I assume most of my listeners don't. You had a near-death experience. Right. Yeah, I did. So I think my purpose started before, <laughs> up in heaven before I even came into the world because I was born with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. So I had already developed, oh, let me flash forward. So I was born with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis and I ended up going to the Junior Olympics. Not normally a childhood arthritis <laughs> thing. And it was because I had this sort of innate inner voice that always felt like that there was a different and, and better way. And when I had my daughter, and to put it in perspective, she just turned 25, I got a staph infection in the bone marrow that spread into my spinal cord. And that's when it really can become deadly. And I did have an actual, you know, die on the table and uh, in the operating table, they were trying to clean the infection and I cardiac and I had the whole uh, experience. It's very much like all these TV shows. I watch them with my partner and I'm like, yeah, I saw something like that. So I think that near death experiences are real. And mm -hmm. for me, it was life changing. And what I, I actually wanted to die. I believe we're given a choice and mm -hmm. I was like, take me. I was in so much pain that I didn't want to continue. And I was basically denied. <laughs> you're not coming. <laughs> we have something very important we want you to do. And you're going back. And I remember it vividly. So very good so, stuff. Yeah. So you had that near-death experience. Now draw the, the parallel, the lines, I mean, between that and when you created Fashion Blaster and, and how that all you know, ties together. Yeah. So it's so interesting. You know, people think that, you know, God in your near death experience says you're going to go back and carry the torch for the system of the body called fascia. And it doesn't work like that at all. But what, what I had was this ferocious appetite to heal myself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, doctors were like, we don't know what to do with you. You are so damaged. We can't operate. You're unstable. You know, physical therapists didn't, you know, they showed up with little pictures of exercises and I couldn't even roll on my side by myself. And then I was just in incredible pain. And, you know, my pain management doctors just, they felt so sorry for me. I mean, I had a wonderful team around me, but I think what I realized and then what I got really jazzed about was that I was going to have to you know, this is my body, you know, like the Bible says, physician, heal thyself. So I, I took that literal and just started studying the human body versus saying like, I'm going to go see how to strengthen a hip or whatever. And I ended up in a dissection course and they were cutting the body open. And when they do that, Steve, you wouldn't believe the entire thing is fascia. It's like the first layer is fascia. You cut through fascia and there's more fascia. It's quote unquote, the white stuff and it's everywhere. And in the dissection, they said, we're just going to remove this fascia. And for me, I'm like, God didn't make that for nothing. It's not, we don't need to take it out and throw it on the floor. Like, why aren't we looking at that? That looks like it's holding my hip together you know? And so it just led to an intensive year of creativity and, and, and study. And I was being downloaded with kind of messages about where to look and, you know, research this person. And, you know, it just, it led to me very quickly understanding that the body was very, very powerful. And I started treating local patients in a chiropractor's office and was doing things that no one else could do. And within a year, I'm treating half of the Texans team. <laughs> so mm. that's how it started. And you can imagine the imposter syndrome in that moment. Like, isn't there like a doctor or somebody, <laughs> you know, doing this? But again, just stepping into understanding that like, yeah, you know, it is okay to be on the cutting edge and it is okay to be the one person 
it doesn't make it not real just because other people don't believe it in that moment, you know? And then amazingly, that's been, you know, 20 something years and now, and now people get it. And now I have millions of followers that get it. And, and, you know, that's an amazing, that's an amazing thing. As you've told me, you said how you've turned a plastic sticks, was it, into a 10-plus-year legacy company grossing $200 million. <laughs> right, right. You know, people always want to know, how did you do it? And I, again, I think it just goes back to, like, I have so much passion around fascia. And it's because, you know, even now, my partner, Jordy, he will, you know, bring somebody from our local town and he'll, he'll be like, he had a stroke and he can't move his face. Can you help him? And I'm like, yeah, I can, you know, yes. and it's, it's like when you know that you have the, the power to do those things, you, you cannot keep it to yourself. I don't know how these incredible inventors go into hiding, you know, for me, it's almost like vomit. It's like, I can't, I can't help myself. So you reminded me of something I wrote, I don't know, maybe five or six years ago, something like that. And it was like, these are the most, I think it was six or seven most dangerous words in history. And the words were, that's how it's always been done. And the point being, if we all just stuck to what has always been done, you, you are the living embodiment of that because you yeah. were being told, you were being told, nope, you're done. That's it. Yeah. When you just said that it, I had like a visceral response, you know, because doing it the way it's always done is, and also the accepted level of excellence with what's always been done. That is inverse to innovation and progress. And in my world healing, that is the, you're dead. You're dead. If you say this is, the way it's always been done. Mm -hmm. I'm always looking for the better way, the better way, the easier way, the more natural way. And it's amazing when you, when you start to vibrate on that, it, it comes. Exactly. And you have to know going in, you're going to face mountains of cynics and skeptics and eye rolls. And I can only imagine the things you've heard of doing this going, who is this person with absolutely no medical training? <laughs> it's so funny, Steve, because I don't get that at all from my users, right? Mm. If you've used my tools, then, then you already know. I'll tell you who's the most guilty of being the naysayer and being like, you know, you don't have any classical training or, you know, whatever, is the media. Mm. <laughs> it really is the media. It's not even competitors. I mean, I have a few, you know, naysayers in the in the therapy world, but it is the media. I will, I'll give you a perfect example. It was so crazy. So the title of the article was basically something in the New York Times recently. Like, what what is this fascia thing? Okay, so then they interview, I don't know, some doctor, you know, physical therapies, whatever. And then at the end, and they say, there's absolutely no scientific proof to the quote unquote recent trend of fascia blasting and that you should never, you know, basically do something that aggressive to your fascia. And I was like, okay, reporter, all you have to do is go to Google and type in fascia blaster research and you will see peer reviewed science, not just from me, but where it's been presented, you know, at the world cosmetic surgery conference in Singapore, et cetera. They didn't even take that step. I don't, I don't think they wanted to present the science. They didn't ask me for a quote, but also in the same breath, why are you talking about me? <laughs> yeah. If it's not important, then why are you writing an entire article on it? You know? So you just have to just, you know, not, worry about that. I love Jay-Z says, never argue with fools because from a distance, no one can tell the difference. So, you know, I, I'm not going to give my energy. I'm not worried about the people who don't believe in it. I'm worried about the people who want to learn. It's that old saying, you know, when the student is ready, the teacher arrives. I am here. This information is available to everyone. Healthy fascia is for everyone. Fascia blasting, which is the method to get to healthy fascia, is for everyone, you know? So mm -hmm. I don't feel like it's my job to 
turn the non-believers. I feel like I do my thing. And when, when, when people open their minds, then, then it's there for them. I can I cannot agree with you. However, we both know, and as we touched on at the top of this, there are let's see, how do we put this? Nefarious people. Um, <laughs> who, right. who there's it's one thing to be a non-believer, non-believer. It's another thing to have gone through what you have gone through in that being in in that disruptive industry, right? Of because it's natural and holistic, and you know, the the medical field alone is going to you know roll their eyes and do a oh, lot. Oh, don't more. talk about natural cures. UFOs, alternative energy, you know, there's these, these subjects, you know, and, and for me, I definitely had that moment, not that moment, many moments where it's like, Ooh, okay. I am in the hornet's nest and I need to retreat a little bit. You know, I think younger, less savvy, Ashley wanted to just drive the tank, you know, through the middle of town and now I'm a little more sneaking in the back doors <laughs> because in marketing, you know, you're the marketing whisperer. I, I do think it's important that people understand that there is delete culture and it's really not that hard. If, if someone with a little bit of money, a few lawyers and some fake profiles, you know, so they can, they can make a shit storm out of absolutely nothing. So let's let's segue into this. It's it's the elephant in both of our rooms because we've lived it. And I will tell the audience a quick backstory. And so when I was at Forbes, for those not aware, and you wouldn't be aware because it never published, <laughs> I interviewed Ashley for an article on the topic of cyberbullying and what CMOs need to know about cyberbullying. Because as you'll soon hear, Ashley was, and hopefully she's not anymore, but she'll tell us, a victim of cyberbullying. And you will not believe who was behind the cyberbullying. I'll get to that in a second. So I wrote the article, did the interview, went to publish it, and I'm not going to name names or do anything like that, but someone, oh, the article published. That's right, Ash, right? Yeah, the it did article. publish. I was about to say, I took screenshots of it. Gotcha. <laughs> and within, I think, 48 hours, it was taken down because someone behind the cyberbullying sent my editor a whole slew of basically crap accusing Ashley of all these things, the charlatan and your uh, snake oil, all this, all the typical stuff that you've heard before. And then that very soon began the end of my Forbes career, which is a whole other story for a whole other time. And it's something that's, I know, is stuck in both of mine and Ashley's crawl, if you will, that this happened. And the irony was so thick that a publication like Forbes would take an article down without even checking the sources Right. I'll never forget this. I mean, I'm, I'm conjuring up all these emotions again <laughs> that I swore I wouldn't. Right. But it, it still pisses me off. And I know it pisses you off all these years later about what happened. And while I don't want to delve into that because no one's going to really care about my time at Forbes, what I want to get into is still the topic of cyberbully. And I want you to tell my audience, you know, what happened, who was behind it. Is, is it still happening? Just take it from there. Oh, that's so funny. I have no idea who's behind it. <laughs> okay. Well, I think I want to really bifurcate the conversation because there is cyberbullying and then there's delete culture, right? And I think that they're different. So cyberbullying is, you know, when very bored people, probably mentally ill people, you know, just kind of sit behind the, the scenes and, and they heckle you or heckle your brand. They make, you know, outrageous and egregious claims. I know for me, I'll give ex specific examples. We had, you know, a woman say that she had two miscarriages because she was using the fascia blasters. There were people saying that their skin was detaching, you know, which of course I'm an FDA regulated product. So I would have to investigate every single claim, even if it's out there in cyberspace, you know? And I think there's this misconception, you know, that you can do a well-worded email or, you know, respond to it head on and, you know, in a classy way and it stops. But that doesn't take into consideration sort of that mental illness component of it. You know, somebody is 
has problems in their own life. And this is their way of sort of scratching the itch, you know, and it's crazy for me. I've had my company for 10 years <laughs> and I still have some of the, you know, same people ringleading. But Steve, what we experienced is more of delete culture. And it's like what you were saying about, you know, these natural cures and alternative medicine. There is someone I don't know, and I don't really care behind that delete culture. And that's where, you know, someone goes and buys 2,500, you know, fake profiles. They, you know, set up a hate group to sort of organize about how to, you know, take you down. And it's not to heckle you. It's literally to take you down. And they do really crazy and egregious things like, you know, organize to mass file with Better Business Bureau. They organize to file hundreds of fake claims with the FDA. They would show up in the comments for every, you know, news feature that I was getting. They would, like what they did with Forbes, they would preempt an article and, you know, try to not have people, you know, put my science out there or things like that. You know, so to me, it's, it's crazy because in delete culture, those are all things that in the real world you could sue for. And, you know, it would be tortious interference in the business. But because it's online, it's considered cyberbullying. And, you know, we just do not have the resources, you know, with the FBI, which is the only people who can manage that to really give a crap about people's, you know, brands, basically. Mm -hmm. So it's something that, you know, I think all marketers can need to be aware of because they can show up in your ads, they can report your ads, <laughs> you know, but it, it, that is a very organized, orchestrated thing where I think cyberbullying is just, you know, these, these yahoos that, you know, come out of left field and do it for a sport. Yeah, I know. I know. It almost sounds like you're joking, but you're not. No, I'm not joking. And it, it's, it's interesting, you know, I'm 10 years in business and we do still have to consider it. You know, I think at the end of the day, you know, the best way to quote unquote win is just to never look back. You know, it's Ziggly, Zig Ziglar has a funny quote that's like, it's easier to wet, get where you're going with a thousand people running with you than one hanging from your neck. You know, so for me, I just released all energy of that. I, I genuinely don't care. And, you know, at the end of the day, my numbers are beating these rhetoric numbers. And that's how you win. You win by being better, by being stronger, by persevering. And, you know, I always am looking at quotes. And this one I pulled for this specific topic. It's like, it's, it's from the Bible, actually, Romans 12, 12, rejoice, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation and be constant in prayer. And that's how, that's how you survive a delete campaign. Hmm. I love that. That's a great line. It's a great scripture. And it just summarizes everything right there. Totally. So let's get into your, your company is obviously very successful. Well, thank you. How did you scale it though? Like, how did you get to that? Because everybody wants to, you know, can not everybody. I mean, everybody wants to get to where you could scale uh, a successful product or service or something. But how did you get to that level? I mean, it's so funny that you're saying, how did I scale? Because I feel like I haven't scaled yet. <laughs> mm. Maybe that's the lesson. Right. I think, you know, the simple answer that your CMOs want, we, we scaled digitally, you know, so it was just as simple as, you know, we started out in a very niche market, you know, which was the cellulite market, but our products do so much more than that. So we were able to scale sort of horizontally going into all types of skincare, sports care, things like that. And then obviously you can scale, you know, geographically, which had some success and not <laughs> success. But, you know, 10 years later, we are still a digital brand. So being able to scale is all about getting your numbers to work within the cost to acquisition the customer. 
And then scaling is just dollars in advertising and dollars out. So for me, I am agile. I am like a cat in the jungle and I take advantage of every new platform as it comes out, you know, and I squeeze it all like a, a towel, you know, and, mm -hmm. and I have been able to scale, you know, we're about to cross the 200 million lifetime revenue, but I will tell you that I am planning. It, it's taken me a long time to understand the world of finance, Steve, but I am about to really scale. And I think that my story is still in its infancy and I had to go through all I've been in the cocoon, you know, strengthening my wings and the scaling is, is about to happen. And the, and the short answer to scaling is you have to have a profitable model. And then once you have a profitable model, you need to bring in a proper investor and mm. then scale. So, okay. So let's segue into that. I know mean, you're involved right in a, in a, we funder campaign. Yes. Tell us. So we actually, so I have taken no outside capital. <laughs> so when, you know, when I talk to the world of Wall Street and they're like, what's your burn rate? I'm like, what's a burn rate? You know, we didn't have a choice. We had to scale profitably because that was all the money we had. We didn't have venture or, you know, private equity sitting there waiting for us to, to tap into. But two years ago in 2022, I was starting to think about my first exit. And I had had so many people from my audience be like, you know, we believe in you. How can we support you? So I did, it was supposed to just be a million dollar raise and it ended up being $3 million. And for the first time I had a, a, a flush of capital and we were able to turn that $3 million into 10 million in real dollars. And we've had an 88% increase in our profit. So we did it very responsibly. And so we, we want to do it again because Steve, I've been doing the wall street. I've been interviewed at NASDAQ. I'm out there talking about how two, women only get 2% of all the professional capital dollars. And that's actually women and minorities combined. So, you know, here's another, you know, limiting belief. We've, we've always done it this way in full effect. And so for me, what I realized is that if I took in capital from professional capital, that they were just going to quote unquote, buy out the little guys. So we decided to do one more round and convert the notes from the last round and actually offer shares this round so that my audience has an opportunity for as little as a hundred dollars investment to have a seat at the big table. Mm -hmm. And that is very exciting for me. I feel like it's my way of sort of taking the people with me financially to the promised land that have mm -hmm. been there for me since the beginning. How can people find out about this? Where can they go? So it's just wefunder.com and I think we're we're raising so well that we should be one of the first things that pop up. It's called the Ashley Black Experience. And like I said, you don't have to be a professional investor or you can be. It doesn't matter. And and you can do as much as a million and as little as a hundred dollars. And you know, it makes us partners. And my whole mm -hmm. message is, you know, we need to show the world of capital that women and minorities not only are capable, but that they missed out on that opportunity. It sends a huge message to the world about people who are not born into that world. Yeah. I, I love that you're giving that opportunity to everyone. It's, it's really phenomenal. Thanks brother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, okay. I want to pivot to something a little more personal, not that we haven't talked about personal and you talked about your, your near death experience and that how that impacted your life. That's a what I want to ask you about who's the who is there any who one person in your life that had a bigger impact on your life than say others? Wow. So, I mean, obviously I have children and your children are your most amazing teachers, but yep. I think for me recently, you know, Steve, if you really look at 
successful people in business, particularly people that are kind of in the, I don't want to say the entertainment, but that they have a little bit of fame that goes along with it. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they normally crumble at some point, right? You know, just go watch iTunes, every single, you know, musician and what they face and, and whatnot. And so for me, I had a huge teacher who is a, a teacher of Indian mysticism, a yogi named Mediella. And her message resonated with me so much when I first moved to Costa Rica, which was six years ago, that I just kind of dove headfirst into that philosophy of, you know, non-attachment and, you know, selfless acts of service. And I'll be honest with you, it completely changed me. So mm. it was her, her teachings, the teaching of the ancient Sanskrits that has really helped me find inner peace. What a great answer. I love that. But thank you for sharing that. Listen, I know we're up against the time. I cannot thank you enough. Of course. I am so blessed for our friendship. Well, um, come on down and let's go surfing. Right? I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I got to get there. I get people with um, a surfboard and a horse every time they come. So, <laughs> Oh my gosh. What a, what a, what a, an invitation. Yeah. You just, you've been, you've been such a blessing for me since we met for my, my soul. So. Well, see, you will always be in my corner because, you know, I have this very, very strong sense of like right and wrong. Mm -hmm. And there have been a few people, particularly people in the media like you that were like, that's wrong. And it's really nice to have, you know, people on the team that can walk away from what others might consider opportunities because it's just the wrong thing to align with. So I, I honor you for that. Oh, listen, I knew we were kindred spirits within <laughs> the first 30 seconds we talked. And, <laughs> like, you know, no, this, this, this woman thinks like I do. You're going to zig while I'm going to zag. Why? Because everybody else is zigging. That's right. Give me the zag, baby. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And I, and I just love that. We are so, so connected on so many levels. I cannot thank you enough for coming on. And I can almost guarantee there's going to be a part two. So thank you again. Okay. Amazing. I'll look forward to it with bated breath. <laughs> well, that wraps up another episode of the CMO Whisperer Show. 